So today we're going to go through the fourth lecture is going to be on John 1, 19 through 2, 23. And it's really going to be four or five segments, but we're going to call it collectively the presentation of the Son of God. And the first thing I want to go through is uh, the testimony of John the Baptist. And then we're going to go through Jesus calls his first disciples, the wedding at Cana, and uh, Jesus cleanses the temple. So... The first slide, or the first section, is going to be John 1, 19 through 34. So everybody open your Bibles. We're going to keep our Bibles open as we go today. And we're going to look at John 1, 19 through 34. And if somebody would, somebody can... Josiah, why don't you read that for us, would you? Do you have your Bible or no? Uh, or can you pull up? Yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, 19 through 34? Yeah. And this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from uh, Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, nor confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? You need to give an answer to those who sent them. Who do you, what do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said. Excellent, thank you. Um, so let's start with John's three denials. What are the three questions that were asked to him, who he was and, and he denied? Who does he say he's not? Let's start with that. And somebody look at the, what we just read and tell me who are the three denials that we have. John said, I am not. The Christ. This is John the Baptist speaking, right? It is. So just to be very clear, I, read, I said this in the last uh, lecture, and it's in the commentary, but whenever we hear the name John in John's Gospel, we're not referring to the author or the disciple, we're referring to John the Baptist. So the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, sent representatives out to talk to John and say, who are you? And they said, are you the Christ? And he says, I'm not the Christ. And then who else does he say? Are you Elijah? Elijah, and he says, I'm not Elijah. And he says, are you the prophet. the prophet? And he says, I'm not the prophet. So that's what you're gonna to wanna to put on your notes. Elijah, um, I'm sorry, uh, the Christ, Elijah, and the prophet. So this is an important understanding of, of, the, um, of John's gospel is what the role of John the Baptist is here. So the first thing I wanna kind of touch on is the place where this is happening. If we look at the end of that section, where does it say that this stuff's taken, it's taken place? In Bethany across the Jordan. It says it's happening in Bethany across the Jordan. So if you guys could, if you want, you can kind of come a little closer. If you don't, if you don't want to, you don't have to, but this is a map of Israel, and this is a map that has kind of locations marked on it from different time periods. But if you look up here, we have the Sea of Galilee. And if you look down here, we have the Dead Sea. And what connects these two is the Jordan River, okay? And so what else we can see on here is down around here somewhere, I'm not looking close enough at it, but around down here somewhere is Jerusalem. Just below that is Bethlehem where Jesus was born. Jerusalem, of course, is basically the capital of Jerusalem where the temple is. Way up here is Nazareth, for example. But the area that's called Bethany by the Jordan is, it's not 100% agreed upon where that is. Although I, I, I'm making a strong, I think there's a strong case that can be made that it's basically right here. Okay, just above the Dead Sea. And what you'll notice about Bethany on the Jor near the Jordan is, to the west of it used to lie um, a, a city called Jericho. And so there's some things that happened at least very near this region, if not in the exact same place as where John was baptizing. And so let's take a look at what those things might be. Um, I'd like somebody to look up and just hold the space for 2 Kings 2, 8 through 11. Parker, maybe you look up 2 Kings yeah. 2, 8 through 11. And then, Isabel, maybe you could look up Joshua 3, 14 through 16. 
And then, um, Caitlin, maybe you can look up Matthew 3, 13 through 17. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, here we are. So here's the verses in case you, you didn't catch what I was asking right here, here, and here. Let's start with um, 2 Kings 2, 8 through 11. Um, <clears throat> then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted to the one side and to the other, till the two of them could go over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, I Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You have asked for a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Okay, so Parker, you read it. Give me a quick version of what you just read. Tell me in your own words what you just read that happened. Um, There's two people there. Who are they? Elijah and Elisha. Okay. And Elisha wants a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Okay. Um, so, and what else do we see? We see the parting of water. Mm -hmm. Right? The, he strikes his cloak into the water. The water parts. They cross yeah. on dry ground. And then what happens at the end of the Elijah story? is like taken up. Taken up into heaven, right? Now scan, I don't know what exact verse it is, but scan a little bit before that, maybe six or eight verses ahead of that, and tell me if you can identify where that happened. What water was it that was parted there? Oh, uh... So they, is it Jericho? Is that what you think it so is? So they're near Jericho, but okay. it's, it specifically references the Jordan River there. Oh, okay. So maybe not, maybe, maybe it's prior to those verses. But anyway, so this is right across from Jericho, where Jericho is, ultimately is, was. And Elijah, Elijah parts the river. Elijah and Elisha go across the river. And Elijah's taken up to heaven, right? I mean, that's a crazy story. So what I'm trying to argue with you is that, or trying to make the point of, is that this happened at or very near exactly where John is baptizing. And so does anybody remember like what was characteristic of Elijah in the Old Testament, some of his description? He was, he was, he wore rough clothing. He was a recluse. He lived in the wilderness. He ate bugs, all the same kind of description that we see of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist is baptizing people in the Jordan River, probably right where Elijah was taken into heaven. So when they say, are you Elijah? There's a lot of reason to suspect that. Maybe on purpose, John was baptizing in that location because of Elijah. Maybe, maybe not, I'm not sure, but nonetheless, it's topology. It's, it's an actual action that's happening here that is giving a good reason for those leaders to ask. Keep in mind, the Bible has been silent. God has been silent in terms of revelation through the Bible for hundreds of years now. And we're now in this foreign occupation. And so they're looking for a Messiah, and they're not exactly sure what to expect. There's all kinds of theories about what, the, what kind of Messiah they're looking for. Are they looking for a king or a priest or a military leader? Are there multiple figures, a, a priestly figure and a kingly figure? Is this eschatology, is all these things that are predicted about the Messiah going to happen all at once? Or are they going to happen over time? You know, the idea of a second coming of the Messiah was probably foreign to them. So all of these ideas are swimming around in their mind. And they see this guy dressed like Elijah at the place where the Old Testament records Elijah being taken up to heaven. And he's baptizing people in the water. And so it makes sense why they would say, are you Elijah? Right? <clears throat> let's look at, <clears throat> let's look at uh, the next one. I don't remember who I asked to read it. Maybe Isabel. Yeah. Joshua 3, 14 through 16. Okay. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the brink of the water, 
Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away. At Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan, and those flowing down toward the Sea of Arab, the Salt Sea were completely cut off, uh, and the people passed over opposite Jericho. So, I told you that this is the Dead Sea. It's also called the Salt Sea. So what we're hearing here now is this is about Israel after 40 years of wilderness wandering. Moses hands off the leadership of Israel to Joshua. Moses passes away. Joshua now sends two spies into Israel. The spies come back with a positive report and they determine that they're going to go into the Promised Land. They're going to cross the Jordan River right here, right in the same region where John was in the future baptizing. This is now going back 1,400 years. 1,400 years earlier, Joshua crossed in the same area and led Israel across dry land. The, the rivers parted again, right? The same river parted again. Actually, this was the first one. I, I started with the story of Elijah, which was later. But the first story that I'm, I'm, I'm telling them in the opposite chronological order, when, when Joshua and Israel passed in, they, they were now leaving from the desert, passing into the promised land that God had promised them. And the Jordan River parts, they come to Jericho, is the first city they come to, and God tumbles the city down while they march around it for seven days. Right? So when you see Joshua, Joshua's ushering Israel into the promised land. He's, he's seeing the promises that God had made to Israel fulfilled by delivering the Israelites into the promised land. Going ahead, we see Elijah in the same place, taken into heaven. His anointing be passed down to Elisha. And now when we read Matthew 3, 13 through 17, we're going to see there's some hints of this in the gospel accounts that we're reading here of John. But when she reads it, we're going to see a more thorough description of Jesus' baptism. So Jesus' baptism isn't quite really recorded in here. It's referred to in here. But let's read Matthew 3, 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it's fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So just as Joshua was ushering in the people of God into Israel, fulfilling the promises that God had made to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and to Moses, now Jesus is ushering in the people of God into the kingdom of heaven. And he's being baptized right here at the same place in the Jordan River. And now we're twice before the Jordan River is parted. Now heaven has parted and the Holy Spirit descends from heaven and rests on Jesus. So can you guys see how it's easy for us to look back and think, what were these people thinking? But now there's a lot of reason for what they were thinking. And it helps us to understand what's happening here when we are looking at the New Testament through the lens of the Old Testament. And it also helps us to reinterpret what was happening in the Old Testament by seeing it through the lens of what's happening here in the fulfillment of the New Testament. Does that make sense? So I think this is an awesome um, example of typology. I think it's an, it, it's an awesome example of just the beauty of like God working through literally thousands of years and weaving together this story um, of his redemption and his, his fulfillment of, of his promises. Um, <clears throat> So when you looked at the story of Joshua, another thing is that the par rivers parted when the people that were carrying the Ark of the Covenant stepped into the water. And the Ark of the Covenant was the representation of, G of God on earth. It was the place where God was most visibly present, most real, the, had the most intensity to his presence on earth. And now we're seeing that when Jesus is submerged under those waters and comes up, that the heavens are parting. It's the same God that's now incarnate, that's now in those waters, and we're seeing the heavens parting and the Holy Spirit coming down. 
couple other notes is that um, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit had rested on people, but it was always temporary. It was generally the leaders of Israel. Here we're seeing now the Holy Spirit coming on to permanently rest on Jesus. And we're going to see John later say that in Jesus, um, he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. And that, that ultimately, that the Holy Spirit can ultimately permanently reside within us. So that's a lot uh, to say about just this section. I have a few more comments that I think would be potentially helpful. So we kind of are talking about what John's not, right? He's not the Christ. He's not Elijah. And he's not the prophet. Now, Elijah in this place represents what we kind of described here. But it's confusing because there's other places where Jesus says that John is Elijah. And I think what that means is that John is literally thinking of himself as the literal second coming of Elijah. People will think, well, he never died. Maybe God's brought him back to the earth. And even now, some people have eschatological views, end times views, that Elijah will have to come back and be killed. That's one of the two prophets in Revelation. I, I'm not suggesting that. I don't know. I'm not even going to get into that in this class. But the point is, is even now people think that that has to happen or will happen. So it's not unlikely to think that people might have identified John with Elijah or wondered. <clears throat> but um, he says he's not the Christ. So people are expecting a certain type of Messiah. They're wondering if he's going to be the one who's going to deliver them. Um, and then he also says he's not the prophet. And I think what they had in mind with this, and you can look at your text a little bit more for more commentary, is the idea of a prophet like Moses to deliver them from captivity. And so he's saying, I'm not here to deliver you from captivity. I'm not literally Elijah. I think when Christ says that John is Elijah or like Elijah, he's referring to typology and he's fulfilling, referring to the fulfillment of Elijah's prophecies. And then ultimate, not meaning the ultimate fulfillment in Christ, but it, as a forerunner. And then in terms of the prophet, he's, he's not the Messiah. So Christ and the Messiah and the prophet in that sense have some dual meaning there in the sense Christ is certainly the Messiah and the idea of a prophet coming to, you know, help them or whatever. I, I think we find that prophet is Christ ultimately. So there's, there might be some confusion there, but that's the idea of what we're getting to here. Um, <clears throat> So that's who he's not, but let's see who he is. So he says, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So for us to understand what that means, we have to understand what's the prophet Isaiah saying, right? So does anybody have any knowledge of the book of Isaiah or any, any substance to it or any idea of what he means by saying make straight? Um, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Does anybody have any, any thoughts on that? It's okay if you don't, but if you do. So let's look it up. So the first thing is, <clears throat> Isaiah wants, so if we look at the structure of Isaiah, this is a really simplified outline of Isaiah. It's very, very simplified, okay? It's more of a survey than it is anything else. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah are generally covering the Assyrian threat. The next 45 through 55 are the Babylonian exile. 56 through 66 are all times and occasions to the end. But if you look at it from the thematic breakdown, 1 through 39 is focused on God's judgment of Israel. Let's look at 39, 5 through 7 as the culmination of that real quick. Somebody read Isaiah 39, 5 through 7. Maybe you guys can all turn to that. Isaiah 39, 5 through 7. So think of this book as being a big, long narration, right? Of prophecy. And Isaiah is saying, Israel, woe to you. You've not obeyed God. You'll face punishment. Somebody read Isaiah 39, 5 through 7. Read it loud so we can all hear. Okay. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Wait, through seven? Is that right? Okay. Yeah. And some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away, and they shall be eunuchs in the place of the king of Babylon. 
Do you guys know what a eunuch is? Do you? Yes, you're saying yeah. Okay. So a eunuch, I'll just, just in case we don't all know what that is, it's a person that's been castrated. It's a person that doesn't have their genitalia male. And so the reason, there's a couple different reasons that people would be eunuchs, but one of them would be because they were forced to be eunuchs, specifically probably so that they wouldn't have any question about whether or not they procreated with um, generally whoever their master would be if they were a slave. And so what they're saying is, Israel, this is the culmination of it, Israel, you've, you've done so wrong that we're going to have you carried out of Israel and we're going to have you enslaved and so much so that your own children are going to be castrated and made to serve in your enemy's home. I mean, that would be a, about as worse of a thing you could ever imagine hearing God say. And that's where we come to the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. <clears throat> let's read these three verses. So let's, these three passages. Let's get somebody ready to read Isaiah 40, 1 through 5, 53, 1 through 12, and then 65. Let's go with Isaiah 40, 1 through 5, Caitlin. Yeah. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her, that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall, shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So if I was going to fill in my note here, I'd probably say that Isaiah 40, 1 through 5, is a transition from God's judgment to what we're going to see in a minute, which would be hope. And specifically, I think it's 43, 40, chapter 40, verse 3, that is the specific verse that John the Baptist is quoting. He said, I am the one, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. So basically, 39 chapters of Israel, it's all bad for you. We're kicking you out of the promised land, and we're going to make you slaves under miserable circumstances to now we have this person that's appearing out of nowhere saying, make, be ready. Be ready because the Messiah is coming, the hope is coming. Now let's read Isaiah 53, 1 through 12. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, men of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we, esteemed him yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death, and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. So you've been waiting, you're, you're a faithful Jew in Israel, and you've been waiting for hundreds of years to hear the next chapter from the Lord and it hasn't come you're waiting for this Messiah you're under Roman captivity and you're trying to interpret what is this Messiah supposed to be and we hear this right well what does this point us to what, what is this 
that Parker just read, what I mean, who are we referring to, and what are we, what, what does that remind you of? Someone who's going to be like a, a savior from sins, like a, uh, uh, yeah, someone that'll take away sins. They'll also be like, uh, that'll suffer. Yeah. So what we would call this is the suffering servant as described in Isaiah or Isaiah's suffering servant. So I can see now why there's confusion. I'm putting myself in the perspective of these Jews, right? And they're saying, wait a minute, this, we have this hope and now this, somebody's going to be crushed for our sins. And, and it's going to be in the grave. Now let's read Isaiah 65, 17 through 25. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. Be glad and rejoice forever in which and in that which I create, for behold, I create new Jerusalem to be a joy, and her people to be a gladness. I will re rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or a old woman who does not put on a face, or an old man. Uh, for the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They, build, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build in another and another. They shall not plant in another eat, for like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be. For, uh, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bear the children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord, and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all of my holy mountain, says the Lord. Okay. So this, we described as a transition passage, and we described that as being fulfilled with John the Baptist. Now we see that we're turning away from this theme of wrath, God's wrath, into the theme of God's mercy and hope, right? Here we see the suffering servant. Where, how did, when did we see this fulfilled? When was he crushed for our iniquity? His death on the cross, that was fulfilled in his death on the cross, Christ's death on the cross. What about this one? New heavens and new earth. The lion will sit with the lamb and, and um, people will not die at a young age. When did we see that fulfilled? We haven't yet. So people, there's, there's a lot of differences in end time eschatology. Eschatology just means the, the study of the end times, the study of the last things. But what's important to note here is that this would be fulfilled in either the millennium, the millennial state, or um, or the eternal state, meaning in, in heaven and eternity, not only in heaven because new heaven and new earth. So, depending on different views of what happens at the end of the world, this would either be a state of a millennium that's yet to happen or it would be fulfilled at the end of the earth, at the end of time, okay? So again, though, keep in mind, this is all in Isaiah. So I don't think that necessarily it was obvious to the Jewish believers at that time that these were two separate comings. You see what I'm saying? The idea of a second coming, I'm not even sure it was, a, was an idea at that time. And so there's a lot of confusion about what to expect with the coming of the Messiah. At least that's what I'm trying to get to. Do you see, does this, does this presentation at all help us to contextualize what's happening here in John? Does it help you to kind of see this in a different light? Or, uh, I mean, if maybe we, maybe some of you guys have understood this already, and if so, that's great. That, that's amazing. Um, <clears throat> but for me, it kind of blows my mind to read it in this context. And it makes me want to study Isaiah. You know, it makes me want to spend more time understanding the rest of the Bible, and I hope that's what this ultimately does for you eventually, too. And, and it takes time. It takes time to figure this stuff out and put it together. Um, <clears throat> so
So just, I don't know if, I'm not sure what I was thinking when I put this slide together exactly, but we have the three denials of John the Baptist. We have the expectation of the coming of Messiah being, uh, I think we've kind of presented something about how the, the expectations were cloudy or people might not have been quite right in their expectations of the coming of Messiah. I think that we can see the baptism of Jesus is kind of the ultimate uh, fulfillment of what we see um, coming in Joshua 2 and 3. Joshua, in other words, is kind of a type where Jesus was the antitype. So the, the deliverance of Israel into the promised land is a precursor to the deliverance of God's people into the kingdom of heaven, right? And we're going to get to more of those themes. John says he's unworthy to the tie the sandal of the one who comes both before and after him. If you look at John 1, 15, John 1, 27, John 1, 30, and John 1, 1, all of these are references to John the Baptist now saying, he who comes before me, or who comes after me, is greater than me because he comes before me. And he's referring, I believe, to Jesus' eternal uh, reality, the fact that Jesus is God, and the fact that Jesus has always existed, and the fact that Jesus even created John and gave John life, but yet he's also his younger cousin, and John was the one who made the way for Jesus, so he came after J Jesus from a ministry perspective and in their family, in their earthly family. But he's pointing to the fact that he's nothing compared to Jesus, only a slave would untie the filthy sandal. Of, of a first um, of a first century Israelite. <clears throat> so the next section I'm not going to have a lot of time on, and I'm just I'm just there's nothing about the next section that's less important than the last section. First of all, so I would encourage you guys to pour out every truth out of every single verse you can, squeeze out every bit of truth out of them. But I just, for sake of time, have to make choices on how I'm going to go through this course. But here, in 135 through 51, we see Jesus calling Andrew and this unnamed disciple. So what it says is that Jesus comes across John the Baptist, and then John the Baptist has with him two of his own disciples, one of which is named Andrew, who they describe as Simon Peter's brother. The other disciple's not named, and, and I would suggest, and, and most of what I've read suggests, that that is John. John, the writer of the gospel, and John, one of the twelve disciples, one of the same person. So it's confusing, because now we have John the Baptist standing there with two of his disciples. One is Andrew, and the other is John the disciple. And when Jesus comes by, those disciples end up following Jesus. Then we see Jesus calls his disciple... Uh, calls his disciples, so there's, there's language in there of him calling him. Come and see is one of the terms that we see used. Um, we see that both when John's, uh, when, when Jesus calls John and Andrew, they say, where are you staying? And he says, come and see. And then we see it with um, when uh, Philip encourages Nathaniel, he says, we found the Messiah. And he says, what good could come out of Nazareth? And he says, come and see. Okay, so that term come and see is an invitation to follow Jesus. <clears throat> and what we see out of this, what I would give you as the takeaways, specifically on this passage, is that there's three characteristics of a disciple that you could flesh out from John's gospel. And <clears throat> with that, I would say a, a disciple is one who is, number one, called by Jesus. What's significant about this is in um, first, century, first century Judaism, it wasn't like a student would, uh, or a, a rabbi or a teacher would approach a student. The student would approach the teacher. So he, he's going against the convention and he's calling his students to him, his followers to him, Jesus is. And I think that's true of our own calling. In one way, we might think, well, we responded to God or we, we sought God. But in reality, we're only seeking God because God's calling us. God's using the Holy Spirit to call us to himself. So to be a disciple means to come or to be called by Jesus. And I would, I would put this in your notes because, you know, these kind of things will be on the, on the quiz. Um, 
Another thing that it means is to be a disciple is to be a follower of Jesus or a student of Jesus. Again, you can use the support for that as the come and see that goes along with that. Just the same as be called. Uh, a follower or a disciple is called by Jesus. A disciple is a follower or a student of Jesus. Um, and then I think the other thing that we can take from this passage is that to be a follower of Jesus is to be a witness on mission. Because what we saw in this passage, what did Andrew do after he was called? Somebody, you can look in the passage. Do you guys know who remembers what happened? It says, Andrew, Jesus called Andrew. He said, come and see. And then what did Andrew do? He got his brother, Peter. He went and told Peter. He said, we found the Messiah. Then what happens with Philip when he's called? It's right there in the passage, guys. John 1, 35 through 51. What happens to Philip when he's called? Is it Philip? Am I, am I miscommunicating that? No, I think you're right. He, does he go and call Nathaniel? He goes and gets Nathaniel. So, to be a follower of Jesus means to be called by Jesus. To be a, I mean, I'm sorry, to be a disciple of Jesus means to be called by Jesus, to be a follower or a student of Jesus, and to be a witness on mission. I think that's what we can take from this, because even though we're seeing it in the context of the first five disciples being called, it's the same thing for us today. To be, a, to be a disciple of Jesus has the same characteristics. <clears throat> um, I'll briefly touch on the next section. Like I did that one, which was pretty brief. Um, the wedding at Cana. So this is a, a really cool story. Um, and you might notice that the calling of the disciples in John's Gospel doesn't match up with the Synoptic Gospels. And I think the theory that Dr. Cook puts forward is that this is a precede, it precedes what we see in Matthew um, or, or the Synoptics. And so we just probably have this idea that there's like this one like calling of the disciple, which is probably true. But really exactly how that happened and, and, and it was that the first time you ever met him that we, what we see in the synoptics there's there might be some cloudy understanding of that for us right because this this is I, the idea is that this happened before what we see in the synoptics so the kind of the calling that they show in the synoptics is an events that happen later so I'm not exactly sure how to reconcile those um, and I'm not going to suppose more than what I just said but um, it might be a, a question to to think about or to, to look into. Um, the wedding at Cana is, in, is important, and I'll, I'll be really quick about this and let you guys go. It's important because um, this is where we see the signs. The um, John 2 through 12 is called the Book of Signs, and there's seven miracles or signs that happen that are pointing to the reality and validating Jesus as the Messiah. And the first one is at Cana, he goes to a wedding and he turns water into wine. We've heard this story before. A couple things that are important to understand about this is that um, there's a big cultural significance related to both hospitality and honor and shame. And the idea of these weddings, they would be multiple days, sometimes week-long events. There would be a lot of expectation. They'd be very expensive to put on. And if if there was something like running out of wine or food, it would be um, a, a huge embarrassment to the family, and it would be like a failure of the responsibility of the, of the family. And so it would be shameful for them, um, and, and it, would, it would be a big deal. Um, <clears throat> there's kind of a, a couple things um, that, that we can point on to here. Dr. Cook talks about the term woman, so I'm not going to get into that, but it's not meant to be received as a derogatory term, but it is potentially a term that is a little bit of a separation from viewing him so much as his mother or his family and kind of like, now I have to go do this work that I'm called to do. Um, and we see the term where he says, my hour has not yet come. That's a tool in John's gospel that builds suspense, and it also points to the fact 
that Jesus' death on the cross was never a uh, an accident or a sad circumstance, but it was it was more than anything like that. It was something that God had ordained, and it was Jesus' destiny that God had 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 planned from the beginning. Um, he's not foiled, you know, you know. Judas didn't surprise him, um, and those type of things. So we see that there's intensity already starting to build towards some future event that's going to happen, which is certainly going to be his death and resurrection. Um, and we see the wedding feast as a metaphor for the messianic age in the kingdom of God. There's a bunch of verses that are listed in Cook's commentary, but all throughout the Bible, the messianic age, the age when the Messiah would come, and um, even like Revelation and the future uh, kingdom, um, all use the wedding metaphor. So, you know, the church is Christ's bride, there's going to be a celebration, there's going to be an abundance of wine. All of those terms are common. And what we're finding here is the themes of newness and abundance, as pointed out by Dr. Cook as well. Um, the, the fact is, is that I've heard it said that like when the six stone jars were filled, when the last drop hit them, that was the significance of the completion of the old covenant. It completely filled. God didn't, Jesus didn't ever um, say, hey, I'm, not, I'm here to wipe that away and not do it. He came to fulfill it. So he fulfilled all the requirements of the, of the old covenant. And now as the dipping of the ladle in there and pouring out the wine, now a much newer, more rich covenant has begun. And we know that doesn't really come into ultimate fulfillment until the resurrection, but it's symbolic of that. And now Jesus' public ministry has begun. This miracle is the, the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And it's ultimately the beginning of a three-year course to the cross. And so that's what we're kind of seeing here in the wedding at Cana and the miracle that's done. Um, whereas the old covenant was left scarce, the new covenant is now um, taking its place. And you can see that, I'm, I'm just going to briefly in, in one minute describe the cleansing of the temple, so I, I'm not going to try to require you guys to go and watch something more. I'll just do it in one or two minutes. When we look and see how that relates to the cleansing of the temple, there's three pilgrim festivals where everybody had to come to Jerusalem to celebrate. The first one is Passover, which is celebrating God's passing over the Israelite homes and freeing Israel from captivity in Egypt. The next one is Pentecost, which is the celebration of a wheat harvest. And the last one is the Feast of the Booths, which is, the, it's also called Tabernacles or Tents, which is <clears throat> another harvest festival, but it has a, a, a remembrance of the wilderness wandering when, when the Isra Israelites had to camp in tents, right? And so uh, Israel would put up tents around Jerusalem and camp in these tents. Um, Josiah, you can go. I think you had to go, right? Go ahead and jump. Um, so the point here is that <clears throat> what we're seeing is not so much to go through these festivals, but what happens in the cleansing of the temple is that um, is that basically Christ is saying, look, this temple is supposed to be a place of worship and a, a, the place that two things happen primarily. One is that sacrifices are made for the forgiveness of sins, and the other is that God's glory dwells here, and that's where he's rightly worshipped. And what he's saying is, look, you've desecrated the temple through the history of what your nation has done. God's glory doesn't even dwell here in the same way that it did. There's scarcity in the worship of the Old Testament at this point. And Christ is coming to bring an abundance and what he's offering is so much greater than what is currently exists in the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. And so when we see the cleansing of the temple, it's kind of an indictment against uh, Pharisaic Judaism, but also it's the, the beginning of the fulfillment of a promise of something that's much greater, much more abundant, and, and that being um, what we see in the person of Christ. So much so, and the final comment I'll make on it is that um, 
when they see him cleansing the temple, the leaders say, the Jewish leaders say, hey, like, what's up? What are you doing here? You have no right to do this. And they, they see it as a messianic action. And so they say, show us a sign to prove that you really are worthy of cleansing this temple. And he says that, he doesn't say, I'll tear down the temple. He says, you tear down the temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. And so obviously there we're seeing him um, giving a hint towards what's going to happen on the cross and his resurrection. And what he's saying is that he's the greater temple that's standing right in front of him. So that's irony that we see in John there. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so that's the kind of the tie-in between these events. And then in conclusion, next week we're going to study uh, John 3. And the journal assignment is going to be about what you're going to read in John 3, which is uh, Jesus telling Nicodemus he must be born again. So if you guys have any questions, let me know. Um, I'll put this up online, and then, um, you know, we'll go from there. Anything before I let you guys go? All right, thanks, guys. Any, any questions? No? Would you mind helping me um, on this scoring sheet? Maybe I can tell you what I did because I haven't been keeping up with it. So maybe I can tell you what I did and then sure. you can tell me how many points. I was going to wonder too, why was like running out of